want to title it so you'll get this down and get it correct. And we're, it's about rediscovering the power of one. Okay? Now, our faith has to be incorporated into the culture or our faith has no expression. If your faith and my faith is not penetrating the culture, then your faith is unto yourself and not unto the Lord. You don't know that you have faith until a demand is put on the faith and makes you exercise the faith that you say you have. Faith without works, James says, is dead. Can you hear that? So just because you say you have faith, until your faith penetrates the culture, and the culture, the word there, is religion. That's what the word culture means. It is religion. Until you in the faith of Christ, penetrate the culture, the culture doesn't know that you have faith. Dead religion, uh, the Bible says, by your traditions, uh, vain traditions, you bring to null effect the commandments of the Lord. Matthew says that. I mean, hear me. Are you there? By your traditions, you've brought to null effect the command. Traditions can be so many things. And the tradition of doing something religious, thinking you're going to move God on your behalf. God's not impressed with your acts. He's not impressed uh, with your uh, uh, doings uh, until your doings has his faith in it. Because the Bible says when the Lord comes back, he's coming back for one thing. He's looking for faith on the earth. How do you hear that? And God's looking for people today who walk in faith, demonstrate faith, talk faith. Now, there's a quote that we have over the door in the Bible school and in the, uh, in the Bible classroom door there. And it says, the doors of history hinge on extraordinary de uh, decisions of ordinary people. Have you here? The doors of history hinge on... Uh, on the extraordinary decisions of ordinary people. Boy, is that powerful. Ordinary people have shaped the world. Have shaped the world. Now, I want to talk to you today on three areas, and I'm going to bring them all together and tie them up in a nice little bow. I want to talk to you today about three areas. First of all is the life of an oyster. You say, wow. That sounds exciting. I mean, think about it. The life of an oyster. I don't think you'd put it on the next uh, movie screen. Here is the, you never see a cartoon about the life of an oyster. Because the oyster lays on the bottom and just lays there. But oh, how that oyster plays such a role in our culture, in our life. So we're going to talk about the life of an oyster. I like oysters, by the way, but I'm going to talk to you about it. Where the next thing is where weakness can be an invitation to your greatness. And lastly, the title, how can we discover or rediscover the power of one? So we got three things to look at. The oyster's life, the Weakness that's turned into greatness, and then discovering or rediscovering the power of one. Those three pieces, I'm going to fit them together today. Are you here? I love the Bible because it doesn't preach about the heroes and heroines of, of the Bible, only telling us their victories. Now, we like to read just the victory part, but there's a lot of storyline around the victory. Come on. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about the oyster for a minute. He's, a, he's an amazing character. And you look at the life of an oyster to set the stage for this whole thing that I want to talk to you about. A piece of dirt or sand finds its way past the hard outer protection shell of an oyster, deep into the folds, uh, layers of the heart of the flesh. A little grain of sand finds its way into the oyster itself. You hear me? And in that process, 
And this piece of dirt, sand, this irritant, this unwelcomed intruder or intrusion becomes in time what we call the costly pearl of great price. Can you hear that? The oyster is the greatest natural uh, cleanser for the Chesapeake Bay. If you'll read, and I live on the bay, so I get pay pamphlets and papers and things constantly, they will sell you enough oysters to create an oyster bed in your, on your property if you live near the water. They're asking you to grow oysters so that you can, we can plant more oyster beds all through the bay. Because the oyster beds and the oysters filter the water, cleansing the water out and purifying every bit of water so the water is cleansed by the oyster. The results of the pain, though, of this piece of sand, it endured, will be cherished, and then it gets passed on to generations and generations after adoring the necks of some of the greatest, most beautiful women on the earth. So the, the little... Uh, the little oyster has an assignment. Yet in that assignment, a test comes. A trial comes. And it gets into the oyster and it rubs the oyster. Now the oyster is not comfortable. The oyster is just uh, not comfortable with that uh, particle. How many of you ever had a spot, uh, a speck in your eye? And how many of you know I had a piece of metal a half inch long went through my eye. Some of you ever had a little piece of sand get in your eye? You think there's somebody in there walking around with cleats. <laughs> and these pearls, each one of them, is an irritant that got into the, the soul of an oyster. And because the oyster lived with it, moved with it, came forth something gorgeous and something beautiful. How many of you know that when God puts a little sand in your life, when he puts a little obstacle in your life, how many of you know that that little obstacle has an assignment? And if you realize that what God is up to, uh, God is up to making you perfect because in weakness his power is made perfect and there's nothing any more perfect than a pearl. We still know the power of an oyster. One oyster can produce two and three pearls. Now, some of your Pacific Oceans can produce, in Hawaii and places like Fiji, they can produce the black pearls. Big, giant, marble-sized black pearls. Uh, I, there it is, a picture. There's the pearl inside there. How perfect is that pearl sitting in that oyster? You got to get a picture. That was only a piece of dirt. When God made you, you were just a piece of dirt. But in the oyster of God's hand, in the process of God's hand, when God finished rubbing on you, he opened his hand, and there you were, the pearl of great price. Are you listening to me today? God is still working on some of you. <laughs> now, we're talking about great women, so the Scriptures gives us a perfect example in uh, Esther chapter 4 and verse 14. And we got to remember now where weakness becomes an invitation to greatness. Like the oyster, we see the power of one. For if you keep silent at this time, Mordecai, who is the uncle of Esther, she is there in front of the king. She's at the palace. Un unbelievable story she is the Cinderella of the Bible and all of a sudden she's there and it says uh, for if you keep silent at this time relief and deliverance shall arise for the Jews from elsewhere but you and your father's house will perish and who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this and for this very occasion in the American King James, it says, For if you 
together, all together, hold your peace at this time. Then shall there be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, Mordecai is a Jewish man, a believer. Esther is a Jew. She doesn't believe. She's not practicing her Judaism. She is, there is a period of, of captivity here. And uh, the king uh, there is a wicked king. And, and, and the whole time of this is a period of time where uh, their uh, Artaxerxes is there. And there's just a horrible setting. And if you were a Jew, you didn't tell it. If you were a Jew, you didn't talk about it. You still there? Now watch this story unfold. When we encounter Esther, there's nothing about her that prepares her to believe that she'll move into greatness. She is the original, as I said, Cinderella. She is alone, unremarkable, and has every disadvantage you could have in society. She's a woman. That wasn't going to work in a male-dominant culture of the day. She was a woman, she was a peasant, and she was of a Jewish background, which she couldn't disclose. So she had nothing going for her. Are you listening to me? Nothing. An outcast. By the way, she had no parents. She had no family except for an old uncle. So many times when we read stories in the Bible, I mentioned it a minute ago, we reveal or we revel, I'm sorry, in victory of the outcome. We like the outcome. We talk about Jesus' resurrection. We don't talk about how horrible that cross was. But if you look inside the oyster, there's a real honest picture of our heroes and our heroines in the scripture because that sand is like David. God had him in an oyster of life. And God was dealing with David to get him to become the pearl that he was supposed to be. Are you listening? The scripture, though, is so good because it doesn't ignore the faults or the shortcomings. Why? I believe the reason is this. So we would hear God say to us, you can do it too. You know that guy comes out, you can do it too. Come on. How do you know you can do it? Jesus said, you can do all things. So God is so good that he brings us to a place that looking at scripture and looking at the characters, we need to see each one of them inside of an oyster. God put Moses in a basket, but it was an oyster. Jonah was in a fish, but it was an oyster. Come on now, are you with me? Daniel was in a lion's den, but it was an oyster. Can I go further? Every one of us is the person that God puts inside of his kingdom and we're inside the oyster and there's a work going on and that work is oftentimes an irritant in our life and it's rubbing us and we're fighting the process because we're about ready to be cracked open and revealed. How many of you know God couldn't have put a prettier piece of jewelry if you've ever seen black pearls If you've ever seen big giant pearls, God couldn't have put a better piece of jewelry in an uglier vessel. Come on. There ain't nothing pretty. You can lie. People who study the oyster will probably tell you, oh, that's a beautiful. They're not ugly. I love them. I eat them all the time. I can swallow them. Boom, man. My wife and I will put them on the grill. We'll eat 75, 80 of them ourselves. Look at that picture. 
How could something so beautiful be hidden in the hand of Jehovah God? And what God is doing with you, nobody can see, but only God. And to get it open, you got to pry it open. You got to work on that thing. And if you were looking for something beautiful, you'd pass it by. You'd say that's a piece of junk. You'd kick it over. You'd move it aside. But inside of that is ready to be brought out to something beautiful. Once God takes something that's nothing, he turns it into something. I believe the reasons. I believe the reasons that God put it in the Bible this way, that we could see the faults and the shortcomings of people. He wants you to say, see it and say, you know, you can do this. I know about you, God says. I know your failures. I know about your struggles. None of them have caught me by surprise, saith the Lord. The things that you want no one to know about and uh, that you try to hide uh, even uh, from yourself, uh, they are not obstacles to my love uh, and to my destiny for your future. In fact, uh, I have allowed some of them uh, and those very difficult things, uh, he says, and I'll redeem them uh, to bring about your greater good and your greater blessing. saith the Lord. These issues in Esther's life became the very platform on which she would stand in deliverance for her nation and her people. My God. We're talking about evangelism over these last few weeks. How many of you know Esther, this unaccepted, lonely orphan, all of a sudden is now turned the heart of a king. My, 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 my. What were the issues? There are three of them. I said it, and I'm going to say these three and come to the end. Number one was family. Have you hear that? Family was an issue. Esther was an orphan. How many of you know you have issues today? And how many of you know in this issue, it was Esther was an orphan. Remember, an orphan is one who was born but not raised by their parents. Too many people today need to realize when, you know, people feel like, I'm, I'm, nobody likes me. Nobody wants me around. I don't know why I'm an island to myself. God takes the solitary and sets them in the family. God wants you to know that all those things are his, his, his process of making you into what he wants you to be. Not many mighty, not many noble. God is assembling something that he will get the glory and not man. Can you hear me? The third one is identity. She was a Jew. So she, she was an orphan. She was insecure. And she had an identity crisis. She was a Jew like many times in history that wasn't a very popular person or nation to be part of. Like being a Christian today. From reading her story with her being in exile, she was estranged from her faith. Mordecai, her uncle, had warned her many times not to tell anybody she was a Jew. Now, she's a Jew in the palace. If the king knew it, she even touched the top of the scepter of the king. If you ever did that, you were killed. She had the heart of the king. All his concubines, he chose Esther. God chose Esther before the king did. You see, God chooses you when you don't think you're very choosable. You see, God knew you from your mother's womb. And when you were in there, God chose you. Before you came out, he knew who you'd be. He knew what your name would be. But if you will just see like God sees and says, uh, there's a pearl inside of the oyster. One of these days, you're going to leave the oyster and be on the neck of greatness. 
How do you know the culture today is having a hard time? Having a hard time with those around us that have faith in God. They just have a hard time with these Bible-toting, gun-toting Christians. What are we, unredeemable? What's the other word? Uh, deplorable. <laughs> you know why? Because all they see is the oyster. They don't see the pearl that's inside of the process. Aren't you glad that God didn't look at the oyster? But he looked inside and said, there's a pearl being made in there. I'm going to keep this one. Aren't you glad that God didn't put you in the bushel basket and just toss you to the side? Uh, but that you uh, were that oyster that had a, that was a pearl being made. And God said, um, take it. David had seven brothers. And God said, no, I want that one. Because that oyster had one thing inside. It had a pearl. And nobody else but the prophet could see it. How many of you know you need prophets today that can see the value that God has put on you and that God has in you? Uh, because if you don't have those prophets around you, you'll think that you're of no value. You're of no use. Uh, you're of no good. Uh, but a prophet says, hold up. Take that oyster. Bring it over here. There's a pearl being made. God wants to turn your mess into a message. God wants to turn your test into a testimony. Can you hear that? You see, when you're told you're going to die, when you're told that your heart or your, or your life or your cancer or whatever is going to take your life, that's a test. But you need to know that on the other side is your testimony that God took me through the process to make me a pearl of great value. When nobody wanted to be around me. Nobody could take a chance because I was a risk. Criminals wanted to kill me. Cops wanted to arrest me. Nobody wanted to be around me. I was a hot potato. And nobody wanted to be near me. But God. But God. God put me in a house that had the x-ray vision of the anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, and could see by the prophetic. Uh, and when my rough-looking uh, oyster rolled down to the front of the church, uh, the prophet said, Yay, uh, yay, saith the Lord, uh, shut that one out uh, because that one's got a pearl being made uh, inside of it. Rock City Church. Born again, blood washed, born again believer, listen to me. For if you keep silent at this time, I'm Mordecai today. I'm the uncle today. You got to listen to me, Esther. I'm going to talk to you, Esther. I'm talking to you, Esther. Listen to me. Uh, for if you keep silent at this time, uh, relief and deliverance shall arise uh, for the Jews from somewhere else. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows, who knows, but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this and for this very occasion. I'm old Mordecai. I'm fasting and I got ashes and sackcloth on me. Uh, and I'm outside of the gate, uh, and I'm there begging on God. Uh, I'm there before God, uh, and I'm saying, Oh, God, uh, use this uh, new millennial generation. Use uh, this group of Esthers, oh, God. Uh, raise them up. Uh, let the king find them favorable. Like Esther, the time is now such a time as this. With seven billion people on the earth, what business do any of us have thinking our individual lives matter to God and his purpose? I'm just an ugly oyster sitting on the bottom of the sea of humanity. How could God use me? An 
all of a sudden, the hand of the oysterman reaches down, pulls your life up off the bottom of the sea of humanity. And he looks at it. And because of the anointing, he sees inside. Uh-oh. This is a precious one. Don't open this one. Set this one aside because when this, put it in the right water. Take care of it because the water of the word needs to wash over this particular oyster because this oyster, if it sits there and it sits in the water and it takes uh, time, something is rattling down inside of there. Something is inside of that oyster. It ain't like them other oysters. This oyster over here, it don't have the same sound. But this oyster, you want to take care of it. This is an oyster got something. Why did God choose you of all the oysters in the ocean? Ain't very lovely. Kind of queer shaped, weird shaped. Some long, some short, some fat. <laughs> Reaches down and says, hmm, this one? Oh. This one is special. And one day you're just walking, doing your own little thing, doing your own little game. And the hand of Jehovah reaches down and grabs that old oyster. So I'm old Mordecai today. I'm your uncle. In the black community, they got more uncles than you can imagine. I'm your uncle today, and you're Esther. And like Mordecai has said, there are no angels coming to deliver the nation. No plagues this time. No fire falling from heaven this time. Instead, Esther, it's just you for such a time as this. I'm going to turn you all into oystermen. You're going after oysters. And in the oysters, you might bring some into the, to the house, but they ain't got a pearl in them. Out of the four seeds, only one seed made it. Out of the four seeds that were sown, only one made it. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. This is a process. God making pearls. Wow. And then I love what they do. They string them together. How do you know God found you, Antonio? He found you, uh, Tavon. Uh, Tiana, you're on here. Wow. 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 Mark, Rosa, Emily. You can got one for you, Emily. A little teeny thing over here, but it's there. Wow, there's an old pearl here. That's mine. Lord, thank you. Tie us together, Lord. Make us a string of pearls. Make us who you want us to be, Lord. May we stop resisting the process and yield to it so we can become all you want us to be.